as well. <laughs> okay, it is Wednesday, February 13th, and we are picking up in Revelation 19.7, where we left off last week. But the question has been raised to explain in a little more clarity Israel as the wife of Jehovah and the church as the bride of Christ. So let me put those two up for you so that you have it. Jehovah is representing God the Father. So I'll put that in parentheses. God the Father. Now we know God the Father and God the Son are one. But we see them in their separation also as the great do I call it mystery because we're finite in our understanding? But the same way you can have someone that can be a husband, a father, and a son, and yet he's one person, we have God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. Okay, so we're not preaching three different gods, one God, but he shows himself in three different personalities, shall I say? Three different manifestations. Remember his name is in Affable. That means it's too big to be contained in words. And that's our God. He's too big to be contained in something that we understand, something that we can put all in, in one box and put a lid on it. No. He breaks that box open. Yeah. He explodes our minds. And then he says, okay, you're in kindergarten. <laughs> <laughs> Exactly. There is not. There is not. And again, my favorite expression, until someone gives me one I like better, is how do you fit the ocean in a teacup? When you can do that, then you can give me coffee. Okay? Jehovah, God the Father, takes a, or has a wife in Scripture, and her name is Israel. Okay? And I'll leave her in red, even though if I had done it right, I would have done it in his from blue. But since I start with red, I gotta leave it with red. So then we have, and I'll use the name you're familiar with, which is Christ. Do you know what Christ means? The anointed. Excellent, excellent. Christ, and I'll put in parentheses, anointed one, because that's what it means. Whoops. All right. He is God the Son. And if I give you in the Hebrew, I can put here Messiah, because Messiah is the Hebrew, where Christ comes from the, the Greek, and it also means anointed, okay? So, it's one and the same. When I call him Messiah or Mashiach, when you call him Christ, we're referring to the same one. Christ comes off of the Greek Christos, Christ in English. Mashiach, Messiah, Hebrew to English, okay? He takes a bride. The common name given to this bride is the church. Now, why I say the common name is if I go into the Greek and I give you the Greek in the scripture, you don't see the word church, you see called out assembly. And I like that because if I say church and you're limited in your understanding, your next question could be, okay, which church? The Man of Baptist, the one down the street from me. Right. This is not denomination. This is all who believe. They're called out. They're separated unto God. They are the body of Christ. He is our head. We are his body. That body has legs and fingers and toes and body parts all over, but it's one body. Okay? I, I, I might sound a silly question, but no what does thing. the Holy Ghost take? He doesn't take a bride or a wife. He, his spirit permeates through because it's he who even calls us out. We don't come to God on our own. We come to God at his tugging. His spirit emanates from <clears throat> the Father. So it, there isn't a... A separate thing. A separate. There is nothing that I can think of. He just, good question. There's no such thing as silly questions. Never. Don't feel silly in my class. We all need to learn. We all, and your question will make us think in a new direction. So please, don't ever feel like there's a silly or too simple or, no. No, and in fact, usually if you're thinking it, there's others thinking it too. I think that then the Holy Spirit takes over. He seals it. Yeah, he seals it. 
He brings us home. You know, he carries the work out. Some say, and I, I don't totally like it because it breaks down, but some will say the thought starts with God, and then um, Christ acts it out, but the Spirit carries it. But that kind of separates them too much for me because Christ created this world with God. Remember when I teach you from in the beginning, and I can't wait to hit that class someday, <laughs> you're going to see that God created, and you're going to see that Yeshua Jesus created. And you're going to see that in Scripture, they both are given credit for creation. So, which is right. They're both right. That's right. So, we can't separate it as much as our little peon brains are trying to do to grasp, hold, and understand. Okay? Now, let me show you again, uh, just from the verses we did last week, because uh, I didn't know we were going to go into this, but I can bring you some other scriptures where Israel's referred to as the wife. But in the verses I'll show you now, it's showing her unfaithfulness as the wife. But still, she had to be the wife to be unfaithful. Okay? So let's look at those again, just real quickly, to catch and understand. We see that, that she even is divorced from Jehovah because she goes off. Okay? He brings her back. Divorce is not his first choice. She's the one that goes off. He brings her back. But he's, she's referred to it that way by Jeremiah, Jeremiah the prophet. So go to Jeremiah. Go to chapter 3 and verse 8. Jeremiah 3. Chapter 3 and verse 8. And in chapter 3 and verse 8 we read, And I saw that for all the adulteries of faithless Israel. So we know who he's talking about. He's not talking about the church. The church didn't even exist at this point in time. He's talking about Israel. So she's adulterous and she's faithless. And because of it I've sent her away and given her a rent of divorce. Now, he gave her the rid of divorce because she wanted it. Not because he said, I'm done with you. Because God is never done with Israel. He promises that. He made an unconditional covenant with Israel. And he said, I will be your God. Now, they can be in line with him and enjoy his blessings. Or they can be in trouble with him and go out to the woodshed and get what will straighten them up and bring them back. Okay? But he never says, I'm done with you. So when he gives her that root of divorce, it's because she's gone off, and I'll put it in terrible but true vernacular, she's fornicating with other gods. Now remember, he is the one true and living God. These other gods aren't even alive. They're stone. They're wood. They're man's fabrication, and yet she's going after them and leaving her God. So he has to let that divorce go through because she's divorcing herself from him. But as soon as she gets her fill of her wickedness and the results that come from that, and she cries out to him, he says, I love you with an unconditional love. I love you with a love that never ends. I loved you with a love that will not let you go. That I let you go into that so that you would suffer. Because in your suffering, you cry out to me and you come back to me. Okay, that's what's happening here. I sent her away, gave her rid of divorce, yet her treacherous sister, Judah. This is when Israel was the ten northern tribes, and Judah, Judah was the southern two tribes. Okay, the ten northern went off into idolatry, the two stayed faithful. The ten got swallowed up by Assyria, they went into captivity. Judah, look at your sister and don't be foolish and follow the same path because it'll lead to the same thing, captivity. You'd think she'd do good. But what do we find a little later? <coughs> Judah also goes off into fornicating with idolatry, with false gods. God says, what can I do? You've walked away from me again. How can I get you? I'll have to let you get rained on because you took yourself out from under my umbrella protection. But as soon as you get wet, soaked to the skin, and you're shivering, and you're crying, and you're hurting, and you realize that you want back, guess what? My umbrella is still up, and I will bring you in. So this is what's going to happen. And Judah's going to get swallowed up by Babylon. Well, guess what? Babylon had swallowed up Assyria. 
So guess where the ten tribes and the two tribes end up? All together. In captivity, and all twelve tribes are brought back. Twelve tribes are not lost today. Don't swallow the lie that they're lost. They have been scattered in the diaspora because once again, they've gone off into fornication. They're following false gods. They're not paying attention to their God. But God has kept a remnant, and he always, always does. He's kept those who are true to the faith. And he's got his hand on them. And in time, when Israel comes to her senses again and cries out again, it's going to happen to be, I believe, because of where we are in the prophetic timeline, I believe it's going to be at the end of the tribulation when she has gone through so much and not she alone. The whole world has suffered this. It's a worldwide tribulation. But at that point, she finally is coming to that point where she's realizing we need our God. And at the time that he's coming back, and we're getting to that today, I can't wait. <laughs> That's when Zechariah 12, 10. If you go to the earlier verses in chapter 12, you see the women are ravaged. The city falls. You see destruction. You see a third and a third again, two-thirds of Israel that's going to suffer, that's going to, to, to die in the tribulation times. But as they come through that time, Daniel's 70th week, and it is a time that God says, I cut short because if I didn't, no flesh would even be left alive. But at that time, when she's finally realizing, you know what? We need our God. He is coming, and she'll see him coming out of heaven. She'll see the one who was pierced. She'll ask, where did you get the piercing? And he'll say, when I was in the house, in the house, excuse me, of my friends. When he was in the house of Israel, in his flesh on earth, those piercings, excuse me, are the nails that he lovingly suffered that he might bring us in. And when they cry out, oh, you are our God. We'll mourn for you as one would mourn for an only son that they've lost. He comes to them, and when they say, Baruch HaBab Hashem Adonai, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, he comes and brings them into that glorious state, sits on the throne, on Yerushalayim, Kama Israel, Jerusalem Israel, sets up his kingdom and brings the nation in from the four corners of the world. The Jews have been scattered. And he brings that believing remnant in, brings them home, and sits as their king on their earthly throne and presents them with all of the earthly promises that he gave all the way back from Abraham. Wow. wow. That's the future of Israel. Yeah. That's our faithful God. That's the one who, even though the wife has divorced herself, he's still going to love her and bring her back. So how do the present Jews look at the story of the prophecy of that the Messiah was going to be pierced? How do they look at that now? The unsaved Jewish person, yes, the they don't recognize him as God's son. They, the unsaved Jewish person today as a whole, and I'm talking a whole, I'm talking a general, not every individual, but those who do anything with the scriptures at all, they go to the promises of the Messiah who rules and reigns. They go to the promises that show him break the yoke off of Israel, set her up as the head kingdom, and it's a wonderful, beautiful picture. And they say, see, Yeshua, Jesus, wasn't our Messiah because it didn't end that way. He didn't set up the kingdom. He didn't break the powers that are over us. He can't be our Messiah. We're looking for that Messiah who's king, who's ruling, who's reigning. So we're looking for Messiah to come. He hasn't come yet. We who are believing Jews like myself, we say, wait a minute. What do you do with Isaiah 53? What do you do with Psalm 22? What do you do with these other scriptures that show a Messiah who comes lowly, riding on a donkey, Zechariah? What do you do with those scriptures that say that he was going to come suffer and even die? What do you do with those? Hmm. Okay, well then there's a Messiah that suffers and there's a Messiah that reigns. Yes. And I'm right in the middle saying, what if it's the same one? Yes. What if it's one right. who comes yes. twice? That's right. Because Amen. only the Messiah is the Son of God. 
And it's never said sons of God. When it's talking about the Messiah, it's always the capital S, son of God. When it talks about the children who have come to believe, who get his name, we're called sons of God. And in our, let's be politically correct today, we'd have to say sons and daughters of our God because we know that it's not meaning just male. It's yeah. male and female. It's free and slave. It's rich and poor. It's Gentile and Jew. One in Yeshua. One name under heaven whereby man can be saved, and that name is Jesus, Lord, Yeshua, whatever language you want to use, Christos, but it's one and the same person, mm -hmm. only one. Yeah. So I can't accept that there's two messiahs, but I can certainly see that God foretold time and again and again in Scripture that Messiah would come, suffer, and die. Messiah would come again and rule and reign. And Amen. that's what we're looking for now because I know he came. How do I know he came? I wasn't alive at that time. But you know what? There is fact that has been recorded. Evidence that demands a verdict, as Josh McDowell put it. There is proof positive. You know there is more proof of Yeshua than there is of George Washington. And yet I ask any one of you, if you don't believe that George Washington was a real person who lived on this earth and was our first president. Nobody questions that. Nobody questions it. But you know what? If he was Messiah, the Jewish person could then say, well, how am I supposed to know? That's your opinion. That's your take. No. It's not my opinion. It's not my take. It's my belief. But it's my belief based on, I gave up my baby, I wanted to hold up my Bible, <laughs> based on the Word of God. Thank you, she's holding it up for me. It's based on that. And you know, that book gave me fingerprints to know the Messiah. And I can even present to you a whole study that I call the case for the Messiah. And I will give you just eight prophecies in that case. And I'll show you the detail in those eight prophecies. Let me tantalize you, give you just a taste. We're in wartime. You have a very, very, very important message. You've got to get it across to your comrade and not to the enemy. So you need to deliver this message to someone you haven't seen before. We're going to set up a meet, and we don't want anything to accidentally happen. Because God forbid we give that message to the wrong one. So. I'll set up, and I'm going to bring it down to home so you all can really picture it, okay? I'm going to meet with this person. I'm going to meet with this person. Let's say we're on Wednesday, February 13th. Let's say Valentine's Day. I'm going to meet this person on Thursday, February 14th, okay? First Thursday, February 14th. We know the specific one. I'm going to meet at 2 p.m. We've got another specific. I'm going to meet at Wendy's. Okay? But I'm going to meet at Wendy's on Highland. And I'm going to meet at Wendy's on Highland by Boulder. Okay? You see how it's getting more and more specific? And then when you're inside, so you'll know anyone that you want to talk with, I'm going to sit in the farthest table from where you buy your food. In the corner. I'm going to wear a pink sweater. I'm going to order a cup of coffee. That's all I'm going to have on my table. Now, by the time they get to February 14th, 2 p.m., Highland, Wendy's by Boulder, walk in and see a single person sitting the farthest that they can from where you buy the food, and there's a cup of coffee and nothing else on that table, they're going to go right to that person and say, I'm here for the message. Okay? That's what God did. I'm going to send you Messiah. And I don't want you to wonder who he is. I don't want you to get any false message. I don't want you to get any other gospel. I don't want you to be confused. I'm not the author of confusion. And I love you so much that I'm sending you Messiah because you have a need. You broke your fellowship with me. I can't have you in my eternal home because you have sin in you. And holy God and sin can never coexist. They can't be in the same place. So you've been banished from my home. But I love you so much that a part of me 
who we call the Messiah, is going to come down to earth lowly and humble. And he's going to deal first with that sin question, or that sin problem, let me put it that way, that sin problem. He's going to take care of that for you. How is he going to do that? He is literally going to shed his blood in your place. Because your punishment for your sin is your blood. And when you shed your blood, your death is done, it's over. So your blood isn't good enough to take care of the problem. But his blood, being perfect, sinless, God-only blood, not human, <coughs> is going to be able to wash away your sin. It's going to be able to carry it so far away that the east is from the west. And guess what? Thank God in his accuracy and specificness, specificity. He didn't say north to south because guess what? They meet. You're going north and suddenly you're going south. But east to west never meets. You keep going east, you're never going west. You keep going west, you're never going east. He's going to take your sin that far away. And the proof of it, I, God, the great I am, Amen. who is more than was and is and will be, he's even beyond that. I'm going to raise him from the dead. And it's Hallelujah. that power that conquers that sin, that puts life in you, gives you abundant life, sets you free, and gives you my home forever with me. And you don't do a thing except accept a free gift. Hallelujah! And then because I want you to know who it is. So you don't go off and follow any yes. false God, any false teaching, any false belief. I'm going to tell you specifically. I'm going to tell you where he'll be born. He's going to be born in the palace of the king, right? Because he's the king. No. no. He's going to be born in a lowly little town called Bethlehem. Why Bethlehem? Faith's lechem, house of bread, bread out of heaven, the manna from God. I'm going to born him in that place. Now, I want you to see how powerful this is. His mom and his earthly dad aren't going to be living there. They're going to be living up north. I'm going to take a pregnant girl. I'm going to let her go on a donkey or on foot. At the end of her pregnancy. And guess what? She's not going to give birth on her out. And she's not going to give birth when she goes back home. She's going to give birth where I promised it. In Beit Lechem. Bethlehem. Micha, Micah, her prophet, our prophet, Israel's prophet, is the one who told us it would be Bethlehem. And remember how I had to say Wendy's on Highland by Boulder? He had to say Bethlehem every time because there were two Bethlehems. He didn't even leave it open to be another Bethlehem. He nailed which one and said she'd be born there. And then he takes a Gentile proclamation that was the first of his kind to move that Israeli family from Nazareth to Bethlehem for the birth. That's a, a mighty sign. Wow. But I'm not going to leave it there. I'm going to give you more prophecies. I'm going to tell you over 300 prophecies of what he's going to do in his life. If there's even one that's missed, throw it up. He's not the Messiah. But if every single one is hit, boom, boom, boom. Well, do you know if only eight, only eight, just eight prophecies fulfilled by one person, that is 10, excuse me, to the 17th power. Do you know what 10 to the 17th power looks like? Uh, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17. That is the chance. Just eight. I'm going to give you over 300. <laughs> His math is easy. <laughs> His math is easy. Now, 
how hard is it to believe in something that's proven again and again and again and again and again? And if you start taking someone who is willing to open their mind, use their brain. Don't check your brain at the door. Bring that brain right in. Use your brain. You need it. God gave it to you for a reason. Open that brain. And let's start with that unsaved Jewish person. And let's say, are you willing to pray with me to the God of Israel to show you if this Messiah that I call Yeshua Jesus is the truth? then let me see it in your word, O oh God. And then I start, and I start at Bereshit, Genesis 3.15. Very beginning, <coughs> first prophecy. And I continue on. And believe me, anyone who comes with an honest, open mind never gets all the way to 300 before they say, I can't review the scriptures. I'm ready to accept my Messiah. And that's been true, the very words I gave you, even from a rabbi, that my dad had the joy of leading to his Messiah. How? Because they opened the scriptures together. They studied them together for a couple of years. And as he was coming closer to believing, they had Isaiah 53 open before them. And he said, I see how the Christians say this speaks of Jesus. And my dad asked him, well, who do you say it speaks of? Because we know what they try to say. And I'll tell you what they try to say. Oh, it speaks of Israel. Go put Israel in there tonight. Read it and put Israel in there. And tell me when Israel has done all of those things that Isaiah 53 says. And it falls apart before you get to verse 3. They have no other answer. But... When my dad questioned him, he turned be red, and he just simply said, I don't know. He wasn't ready to say who, but he wasn't able to deny what he was seeing. And the very next class, because my dad was taking um, um, Hebrew on that level, scholarly level, when he came for his next lesson, he said Maurice threw open the door and said, I can no longer refute the scriptures. I'm ready to accept my Messiah. Hallelujah. 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 That's what I'm saying to God. That's my proof. It's not my words. Rochelle will die. Her words will die with her. The Word of God lasts forever. Amen. The Word of God, and that's why I tell you all the time, anything that you're taught in this class, see it in the Word of God or throw it out. Don't accept anything from anyone. Oh, but he's my pastor. I love our pastors, and I'm speaking against my own peers, okay? But they're men, and we're all fallible. And I pray to God, you don't hear it always here in class, but I pray to God, oh, Lord, let me speak and teach only truth. And wherever I don't, let them not hear it. Let it fall on deaf ears so they not hear something. Because I'll make mistakes. I've been corrected. I've stood before you and said, I understand this differently now. I see something different as I grow in my walk with the Lord. So I don't want you following me. And I don't want you spoon-fed by your pastor either. Because you know who else did that? Jim Jones. And they all drank the Kool-Aid because he told them to. Use your brain. God's not afraid of your intelligence. He gave you all the signs that you need. And he gave them to you on every level for every walk of life. Simple enough a child can understand it and complicated enough for a brainiac to appreciate it. God is amazing, awesome, ineffable. You're going to hear it tell it. <laughs> it's gonna be the, the word on, uh, in your vocabulary is going to pop out all the time, too, like it does for me. Wow. This is what we bring. So how does an unsaved, to come back to your question, I did go way off, but I trust that you're gleaning from it. How does an unsaved Jewish person look at it today? They want to deny that Jesus was Messiah because he didn't come kingly. He didn't come and set up the kingdom and rule and reign. But if they're honest with the scriptures as we present it to them, they will have to come to the point where they will say, okay, he did come. He fulfilled each one of those prophecies. He did it exactly. He didn't miss one. He is who he says he is. And oh, by the way, 
Those who say that Jesus never claimed to be God, don't read the book of John. Because in Yohanan, it is all over the place. And other scriptures too, but many a time in the book of Yohanan alone, where he claims to be God. Did the high priests, the, the Pharisees, and others catch that he was claiming that? Yes. 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 They rent their clothes because they kind of considered it blasphemy. And in fact, that they shouldn't have done, but they did. They broke their own law because they were so upset by it. But they got it. They didn't miss it. They saw this, what he was claiming. So if they'll come, in all honesty, with that mind that's open to the truth, with the word of God before them, then they'll come to the point that they'll come into saving faith and believe Yeshua, the Son of God, is the fulfillment of Isaiah 9, 6. For unto us a child is born. And as the son is given, son was never born. And then it tells his wonderful names. And I'm not going to quote them right now because if we get to our lesson today, I literally bring that out in our lesson today. And I think we might still get that far. We'll see. But after he gives those wonderful names, the wonderful is the first, then it says that the government will rest on his shoulders. There is your king sitting on the throne, ruling and reigning. And actually, the 6 and 7 of Isaiah 9, Yeshia 9. So yeah. in those two verses, you've got the whole thing right there. And then we've got 7.14 telling us his virgin birth. That goes back to, to Bereshit. And it just keeps going, and it keeps going, and it keeps going. So pray with me for our unsick Jewish people today, because the scriptures also tell us there's a veil of blindness over their eyes that they not see. I constantly pray, Lord, give them glasses, open their eyes, let them see, unstop their ears, and let them hear. Not me, not you, but your voice out of your word, and come to know the truth, that they might be set free. And when Yeshua claimed, I am the way, the truth, the life. No man comes unto the Father but through me. He told him like it is. I come to do the will of the Father. I've come in humility. I will be raised up. I am Son of God. I am very God himself. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Yay. Hallelujah. <laughs> I gave you one verse only. Did I even do all of eight? I think I did finish eight. Okay, I did. Go down to verse 14 in Jeremiah, Jeremiah 3. And it says, Return, O faithless sons. Or uh, you may have a different word in your version. Children. children? Okay. Return, O faithless children, declares the Lord, for I am master to you. I will take you from a city and two from a family, and I will bring you to Zion. Zion. That's that Jerusalem is on Mount Zion, that, or Mount Zion's part of Jerusalem. I don't know how to say it right, but I'm geographically challenged, but I'm telling you, he's talking to my location. He's telling who he's talking to. He's talking to Israel. Yes. And he's saying, I'll bring you back. He's called her an adulterous, uh, faithless, treacherous, all that up above. But he says, I'm going to bring you back. I'm going to bring you back. I'm going to bring you back. Anybody read the book of Hosea? Hosea? Do you know what that book tells all the time? Hosea marries this gal, but she's going to go off and be unfaithful. Bring her back. She's going to go off and be unfaithful, but bring her back. She's going to go off and be unfaithful, but bring her back. Time and again. And that is a picture for us of God with Israel. She's going to be unfaithful, but take her back when she's ready to come back take her back. And God says, I will always take her back. Always. You will always take us back. Backslidden Christian the same way. Yes. Yes. Okay. We see the divorce. Let's see that she's referred to also in scripture as a widow. To be a widow, you had to have been married. You had to have been a wife. Okay. And when we see her in her widowhood, she's going to be brought back to life because we know God never finished off Israel. Even when she went into captivity, he kept a remnant. But let's look at Lamentations 1 1. Lamentations is by the same author as the book we've just been in, Jeremiah. It's his next book, so just flip a few pages. Go to the very first verse of this. 
and Lamentations is a lament. So you know this book is sorrows. That's you know this book is, is the weeping prophet crying. Aye, and he cries. Bless his heart. How lonely sits the people that was, I'm uh, sorry, how lonely sits the city that was full of people. She has become like a widow who was once great among the nations. She who was a princess among provinces has become a forced laborer. Do we see that? We definitely see that. Look at her time in Egypt. She literally was in forced labor. She was slavery. Okay? Yes, we see that. And we see it at other times also. And the city sat lonely. When they went off into Babylon, Daniel goes into Babylon with them, Daniel. He is a great example. I highly respect Daniel. I admire him. I look up to him. I can't wait to meet him. He was a prophet. He was a man of prayer and a man of prayer and prophecy and purpose. purpose. Thank you. I almost said power, <laughs> which is good too. But when we went through the book, we saw that a man of purpose, a man of prayer, and a man of prophecy. He's a great example to us because he saw the 70 years coming to an end. He took God literally at his word. Dear God, we're coming up on 70 years, and you promised captivity ends at year 70. Now, notice he didn't pray that when he went into captivity. He didn't pray that in the first 10 years, 20 years, 30 years, 40 years. Why am I dragging this out? Because 70 years is a lifetime, people. Yes, it is. Daniel's in his 90s. That's why he didn't go back. Because he's an old man. Bless his heart. He never got to go back to his homeland. But he knew God wouldn't forsake. He knew God would keep his word, the accuracy of it seen a prophecy, and he prayed, put it in their heart to go back and raise up a people to go back. And under our Ezra and Nehemiah, we read of the going back. We read of the fulfillment, and we move forward. Again, we see the widowhood was what it, it appeared like, but it wasn't a completion. Look at Isaiah, Yeshia, Isaiah 54, 4. And remember, we don't take things from just one whenever we can. We back up scripture with scripture. And out of the mouth of two or three witnesses, let a thing be established. Why? Because one can be so sure they saw something, and they can be so wrong. But if two or three come together, and you're in a court of law, and you're the jury, and you're listening, and you want to know what really happened, if you hear two or three who didn't get together and feed each other what to say, I'll tell you this is how it happened, then you can be a little more secure that this is how it happened. So that's why we look at other prophets and other prophecies. Isaiah 54, 4 says, Fear not, for you will not be put to shame. Do not feel humiliated, for you will not be disgraced. But you will forget the shame of your youth, the reproach of your widowhood, you'll remember no more. Now, Who's Isaiah talking to? Is he talking to the church, the body of Christ? When did Isaiah live? 700 plus B.C. Probably about 750 B.C. This is probably somewhere around in there that this is being written. That means 750 years before the Lord set foot on this earth in human form. Isaiah is talking to Israel. Israel and the church are too distinct. The church isn't even born yet. He's talking to Israel, and he's telling her, you're not going to remember the reproach of your widowhood. You're going to be brought back. Okay? And I gave you the example of Hosea. We'll look very quickly, uh, because in Hosea, she's called a harlot. And a harlot's because she's going off fornicating with false gods. She's going off uh, on her own. She's not staying true to her vows. Hosea chapter 2, verses 4 and 5 will be the first that we look at. We'll drop to verse 13 in that same chapter. Hosea, Hosea in Hebrew, chapter 2, verse 4. Also, I will have no compassion on her children, because they are children of harlotry. For their mother is played the harlot. She who convinced them, conceived of them, has acted shamefully. For she said, I'll go after my lovers who give me my bread and my water, my wool and my flax, my oil and my drink. What are we reading? Israel went after others who were worldly goods. Her eyes weren't for her God. They were for the lust of the flesh, the lust of the world, the pride of life. That's what she went after. 
And she acted shamefully. Verse 13, I will punish her for the days of the Baals. Baal is a false god. When she used to offer sacrifices to them, she went so far off base she sacrificed to the false gods. And I won't even tell you how bad that sacrifice was. If you want your stomach to turn, go read it on your own. It's in the Kings and other places too. If you don't know it, you want to know, come talk to me afterward. Uh, she used to offer sacrifices to them, adorn herself with earrings and jewelry, and follow her lovers so that she forgot me. Wow. Talking about Israel. Israel. Yes, right. Yes. Yes. She is the, Hosea has been given the living example of his wife who has gone off in harlotry on him. But it's the, the bigger picture is this is what Israel has done to God. Okay? Look at chapter 3 and verse 5. Chapter 3 and verse 1. Hosea also. Yes. Hosea chapter 3 and verse 1. Then the Lord said to me, to Hosea, Hosea, go again, love a woman who is loved by her husband, yet an adulteress. The Lord loves the sons of Israel, though they turn to other gods and love raisin cakes. Raisin cakes was part of the false worship in their idolatry. But you notice how he compared the both? He put himself right in there. So this is how we draw these conclusions. Um, I think that's enough verses to give you right now. I'm looking to see if I have any other, and I think it goes on into other meaning. Um, I'm wondering about Isaiah 62. Let's check that real quick. I'm not sure that's on our theme. It may not be, but if it is, then we'll, we'll read it. Because I want to fully answer the question with Scripture. Isaiah 62, 4 and 5. Okay, it still fits enough. Isaiah, remember, the prophet to Israel. Isaiah is Jewish. He's talking to a Jewish audience. And what's being recorded here is it says, It will no longer be said to you, no longer be said to you, Israel, forsaken, nor to your land will it any longer be called desolate, but you will be called my, capital M, God. God's delight is in her. And your land, married, because remember, Israel's married to God. For the Lord delights in you. To him your lamb will be married. For as a young man marries a virgin, so your sons will marry you. As the bridegroom rejoices over the bride, so your God will rejoice over you. So God is looking at Israel as his wife. Okay? Don't be confused if we use bride and bridegroom here. It's still, the comparison is still there. He is showing. Because there is no church yet. So he's not suddenly talking about the church. Okay, he's just saying it's the same thing. How many married men still refer to their wives sometimes as their bride? I hear that. Okay, that's, that's what we're looking at. Okay, that's the way it's meant here. Okay, it's that love. It's that first love. It's an exciting love. Okay? Okay, and chapter 54 in Isaiah, verses 4 and 5. 54, verses 4 and 5. Isaiah 54, verses 4 and 5. Fear not, for you will not be put to shame. Do not feel humiliated, for you will not be disgraced. But you will forget the shame of your youth. I think we read this before. And the reproach of your widowhood will you remember no more, for your husband is your maker. God made her, God's her husband, whose name is the Lord of hosts, and your Redeemer is the Holy One of Israel, who is called the God of all the earth. Now, in those two verses, I see names given to God the Father and God the Son the same way that I told you. God the Father is given verses that tell us He created, and God the Son created also. How can they both create? Because they're one. They're a deity. They're an equality. <coughs> It is not a father-son where the son is lesser than the father. It is a father-son equal. Remember where they're sitting right now? They're sitting on one throne. It's a love seat. It's big enough for two. Don't you love it? Can you picture it? Don't you just see it? Okay, well I'm going to use that for our launching pad. Let's jump back into where we are and see our heavenly picture. Yes. When you said that uh, for your husband is your maker, the husband is God the Father. Yes, right? yes, yes, yeah. He refers himself as a husband to the wife. 
Yeshua, we're going to say, even though that one verse will throw you, we're going to say is the bridegroom with the bride. Okay? And we're going to see that the church is presented in that picture as a bride. And we'll see that as we move on into other scriptures. So um, I think I think it'll come up soon. If it does not, remind me so I bring it up. So I want you to get the whole complete picture. Okay? It's a rich study. Of <coughs> see, was that a dumb question? No. That was a very good question. <laughs> we love questions because that's how we learn. Me included. Okay? Now I'm going to give you a little more typology because that's what, where we left off. We had been talking about, in fact, you know what? We did the wife and bride verses a little earlier. So let me just give you, let's just go real quick to Ephesians because that's one of our best. To see it, I do need to do that now because I thought it was coming up, but it's just past. And it'll get us right into our thought for today. Ephesians chapter 5, we'll start with verse 22. I doubt I'll read them all, but you'll want to read it on your own, 22 to 32. I'm going to read the beginning and the end. At first, you're going to wonder, okay, why is she reading this? But hang on, you'll see how I tie it together. Wives, be, subject, be in subjection to your own husbands. And that does not mean be a doormat. That doesn't mean that you're a slave. But it means that you, you allow him to be your head. Like Adrian Rogers used to say, two heads is nothing but a freak. <laughs> so you've got the head, the husband made the head of your wife. Ephesians 5. Alright, Ephesians 5. We are back on your cross-reference pages. We are back on there. Ephesians 5, 22, that's an E. When I write above my head, it's a little hard. 22 through 32 is what you're going to read on your own. Okay? So, show Paul. A very good Israeli who came out of a background of Judaism, who did not walk away from being Jewish, but put his faith in his Messiah, is given instructions to what we call today the church. And that's what we're going to see here. That called out assembly is who he's talking to. And he never tells them if they're Jewish, quit being Jewish. Because how do you quit when you're born? <laughs> I never have figured that one out. <laughs> and you will find, if you study the full scriptures, don't just study half or a part and don't segregate and separate. It's one story from cover to cover. Bereshit is the beginning. Revelation is the revealing of Yeshua HaMashiach in His glory that we're talking about that Israel would never see in Scripture if we didn't have Revelation. So Revelation is showing of the Messiah and His glory that's been promised all the way through what's called the original covenant. And I use that because that's a better word than old because of old gives you the idea antiquated. And you will find what Shaol Paul teaches that the root, the base, is in Judaism. The base is seen in the original covenant. Is built on. The root is what comes out is Judeo-Christianity. Judaism is the five Christianity is the flower. That's what you have. You can't throw the baby out with the bathwater. You've got nothing. <laughs> you don't want to do that. You want to see it in its fullness. It all comes down to a root. What's the root? Christ. Amen. Christ in English, Christos in Greek, Mashiach in Hebrew, Messiah. Christo in Spanish. There you go. So don't miss who it is. That's the root. Out of that root, he is the root that's even the basis for Judaism because Judaism pointed them to their God. Judaism came with a whole lot of rules and regulations. Why? Because it was a uh, um, schoolmaster. It was a tutor. It was to point them to the fact, here's God's holy level. You can't get there. Uh-oh. We've got a problem, NASA. <laughs> no, we don't. We don't have a problem. We've got shed blood. Yes. We've got yes. a Redeemer yeah. who right. now is in us to forgive us and has forgiven us past, present, and future, but who is going to child train us to break those laws? No. Whoa. To keep embracing them and continue on in them. Because where are we now given the right to murder, yeah. to covet, right. to not keep a, a day holy unto Him? 
to not honor our parents. Where would God ever say, oh, you don't need to do that. Walk away from all that. Forget it. It's done. Throw it away. There goes the baby with the bathwater, people. <laughs> don't do that. But realize that condemnation, Romans is so good. Lays all this down. Romans chapter 5 and verse 8 tells us that God loved us even while we were yet sinners. When we go into 8, we see there is now, therefore, no condemnation to those who are in Messiah Yeshua, Christ Jesus. He didn't say, there's no law, you're free, go do, have a nice time, anarchy, hope you don't meet somebody going on the red light because you went on the green light and it didn't matter because there was no rules. <laughs> That's a disaster waiting to happen. But he says, I'm in you now to enable you to live that sanctified life that makes you keep those commandments. That's why the Psalms tell us, and nobody's afraid to embrace and keep the Psalms today, right? But why do the Psalms tell us, meditate on his word day and night. Let not your law depart from my mouth, oh God. Why do the Psalms continually talk about the law if we're supposed to throw it all away? No, we don't throw it away. But thank God we're not condemned because we can't keep it. We're free. The law did in essence die. Because the will comes into effect when there's a death. And the death was the death of the law. It no longer holds that curse over us, that power over us. The wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord, through Yeshua, Hamashiach, our Adonai. See how it comes together? We've got the best of all the worlds, and I love it. So my Jewishness stays right there, and it gets made full. Or as we choose to say, who are believers, we are completed Jews. Notice I didn't say convert. Convert means I've turned my back on everything Jewish, and I've moved this way. I did not do that. I will never do that. I embrace my Jewishness. I fulfill it in my Messiah. How can believing in a Jewish God make me less Jewish? <laughs> Another problem for our Jewish people is struggle. <laughs> okay, in Ephesians, now we're down to this wife, this bride of the anointed one, this what we call church or called out assembly. And we have wives, be subjected or be in subjection to your husbands as to the Lord. For the husband's the head of the wife. As Messiah, as Christ, as the anointed one is the head of the church, he himself being the savior of the body. That's where we get, okay, we're being told we're the body, and he's our head. But as the church is subject to Messiah, to Christ, so also wives ought to be to their husbands and everything. And husbands, you're to love your wives as Messiah loved the church and gave himself up for her. Show me a wife that has a problem with a husband that's willing to lay down his life for her. There's no problem. God doesn't give a problem. He shows you have that kind of love. You're going to come together in unity, and then you're a beautiful picture of him. Because he is a unity. Also, try unity. Okay? So, we have that he might present himself to the church in all her glory, having no spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that she would be holy and blameless. Okay, now let's drop down to the end and read all these verses on your own. But uh, verse 31, for this reason a man shall leave his father and mother and shall be joined his wife. The two shall become one flesh. The mystery is great, but I am speaking with reference to, so see, he spells it out. It's not my idea, it's right here. I'm speaking to Christ, to Messiah, to the anointed one, and to the church. Nevertheless, whoops, I guess I don't need to go on past that, okay? So he is calling the church, the wife <coughs> of the husband, the bride, and the bridegroom, okay? And that's what we're seeing when we go in back into Revelation 19. We are going to see the marriage supper that follows the bridal ceremony. The bridal ceremony has taken place. Now we're moving to the time of the marriage feast. But we see that he is very clearly presenting that... The called out assembly of today that we commonly call church is the bride of Christ. He's our bridegroom. And that body today is made up of Jewish and Gentile 
believers. The common denominator is our faith. Our faith, that's one. The way that I showed you that it comes together, and it's one. That's what he's talking about. So we saw that, um, last week we saw that this church is shown to be chaste, is shown to be presented as a virgin, is pure presented to the Lord. Not because all the individuals live perfect, holy, sinless lives, not one did except our head. And because we're in him and his shed blood covering us, that is how we're seen as pure and is presented that way to our bridegroom, okay? Um, I told you that I'd bring out to you the typology. Remember, we're talking in generality now. We're not talking every specific because the body of Christ, of the church, of the Messiah, of the anointed one, the called out assembly, I'm putting every name in there so you understand me clearly, today is made up of Jewish believers and Gentile believers. But as a whole, when it's talked about in scripture, it's looked at as a Gentile bride. Because God is working through the times of the Gentiles to provoke Israel to jealousy. Remember Israel, you were to be that priest. You were to speak this out to the nations. You were to take my message to the world. Because you dear Gentiles were never left out. You were never forgotten, never second class, no. But remember how Adrian Rogers said two heads is nothing but a freak? God used Israel as a head nation to present to the world. And when Israel dropped that ball, so to speak, God didn't say, I'm done with you, I'll replace you. No, he said, okay, let me raise up another people and let you see what you're missing so that you might realize, wow, I don't want to walk away from that. I want that too. And the beauty is, God says, okay, come on in. So Jew and Gentile both come in on equal footing today. This typology we see all the way back in scripture. We can take it back to Abraham and Sarai. When Abraham and Sarah came together, they had Yitzhak, the child out of faith. We know that. Yitzhak grows up. He needs a bride. Abraham sends Eliezer, his servant, to get him a bride. He gets Rivka, Rebecca. A good Jewish girl, right? <laughs> you're good, you're fast, and you're with me. There wasn't what was called a Jewish person even yet. But let me tell you how she's described in Scripture. Go with me to Bereshit, to Genesis chapter 24. Genesis chapter 24, and we are going to look at verse 24. That one's easy for you to remember. Genesis 24, 24. No, no. You're thinking Rachel, who put them under sat on? Oh. Yeah, that was Rachel. And that was not one of her final moments. <laughs> no, this is this is before. You have Abraham and Sarah, you have Isaac and Rebecca, and you have Jacob and Rachel and Leah. Okay. All right, Genesis, Bereshit 24, 24 says, and is, is Rebecca, is Rebecca speaking, she said to him, I am the daughter of Bethuel, the son of Melchah, whom she bore to Nahor. Okay? She just gave her family genealogy. This is who she is. Remember the names, daughter of Bethuel, son of Milcah, whom she bore to Nahor. Okay? Drop down to verse 47. Verse 47 gives us a little more, and it says, Then I asked her and said, Whose daughter are you? And she said, The daughter of Bethuel, Nahor's son, whom Milcah bore to him. So again, I say mom, dad, and child. No problem, right? Okay, keep those names in mind. Go to the very next chapter, chapter 25. And we're going to go to verse 30. I'm sorry, 20. 25 verse 20. And 25 verse 20, we read, Isaac, Yitzhak, was 40 years old when he took Rebecca. Rebecca. So we know we're talking about the very same one, same time, everything. And now she is described as the daughter of Bethuel. Yeah, that's what chapter 24 told us. And who is Bethuel? The Aramean of Padan Aram, the sister of Laban, the Aramean, to be his wife. So we see that she is an Aramean. Okay? An Aramean. That's her descent. Okay? So, 
This was a Gentile, in essence, not Jewish, of course it wasn't Jewish yet, but let's go a little further and see another picture because we have Yosef. Joseph. Y'all know the story of Joseph, he's one of the sons. He gets sold off into slavery, he goes from slavery to the pit, but he goes from the pit to the palace. When he's in the palace and he's being presented with reward, he's given a bride. Okay? He marries a Gentile bride because he's the only Jew around there, people. <laughs> he marries, um, I don't remember her name, I didn't write it down. She's Egyptian though, okay? And let me bring to you, while we're going to Genesis chapter 41, let me bring to you that in Scripture, Yosef is probably the most complete picture of the Messiah that we can find. His life parallels, some say that they can give you 99 points where Yosef and Yeshua have the same picture. I've, I've taught many a time, and I've taught with different viewpoints. I've never got to 99 yet, but there's a whole long laundry list of how Yeshua and Yeshua, I'm sorry, Yosef and Yeshua have the parallel. So he's a great picture for us to see if he's a picture of our bridegroom let's see, the bride, okay? And so I'll show you how he married an Egyptian bride in uh, chapter 41 and verse 45. We read in verse 45, then Pharaoh named Yosef, and he gives this Egyptian name, uh, Zaphonath, Pania, you can say however you want, and he gave him Asana, the daughter of Potiphar, priest of On, as his wife, okay? This is an Egyptian who's actually in idolatry. Okay, look at chapter 46 and verse 20. Chapter 46 and verse 20. Whoops, I still want Genesis. I want chapter 46 and I want verse 20. And we read, Now to Yosef in the land of Egypt were born Manasseh and Ephraim, whom Asenath, the daughter of Potiphar, the priest of On, bore to him. I'm having trouble following my Bible there, born to him, okay? So the mother of Manasseh and Ephraim, who we know are part of the 12 tribes of Israel, <coughs> we hear their names, Manasseh and Ephraim, I'm sorry, in your English, they had an Egyptian mom and a Jewish dad. We call him a Jew tile today. <laughs> <laughs> my dad coming out <laughs> Those of you who know my dad, you'll hear of him. <laughs> Okay, let me give you another example. Look at Ruth. I love this book because of the history of my family where my mom was a modern day Ruth and lived out the story and she had her modern day Boaz. But I'm going to take you back to Boaz in the book of Ruth. He is the kinsman redeemer. That's the one who was as close as could be to the family, related to the family, so that he could rescue the family. That's simplified kinsman redeemer. We'll have to do a whole story on, on Ruth sometime to get the fuller picture, but again, it's a picture of Messiah so clearly. Look at Ruth all over it. It's a story of love, and the word love is never in it. It's the story of Messiah for his pride. For his, it, 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 the whole picture is just there. But here, in this case, what I want to bring out to you is Boaz, the eligible Jewish bachelor who was upstanding, well-respected, could have probably had anybody he wanted, Sets his sights on a little Moabitess by the name of Ruth. <laughs> the name of Ruth. And he marries her. We, we know the story. I'm not going to go through it all along. But let me bring out something else very interesting because I brought you out prophecy before to, in this class today. The Moabitess nation in Deuteronomy 23 was cut off, not able to come into the synagogue at all, to be a part of Israel at all, for ten generations, because they turned their back on Israel at her time of need, and because of their idolatry also. Do you know that Boaz and Ruth are the grandparents of David? David. That means David has a smidge of Moabitess blood in him. Now, he's in Israel. Ruth and Boaz. The whole book of Ruth. Ruth and Boaz. He's raised up as the king of Judah. Guess what generation David was from that prophecy? 11th. 10 cut off, and he's of the 11th. Do you see God's 
curve wow. that tiny. Wow. And yeah, that's a wow. And that deserves wow. another. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> okay. Now, let me take you also to Zechariah, Zechariah chapter 12 and verse 10. This is one of the prophecies that I brought out to you just a little bit ago. I told you that uh, Israel would see the one who she had pierced. 12.10. And she would mourn as one mourns for their only son. Okay? What I'm bringing to you here is Israel is off. She's not in line with, with um, how am I trying to say? She's not in obedience to her God. She is, has been out in sin again. Zechariah. Zechariah 12.10. Okay? You see in the earlier verses, though, look at verse 3. It will come in that day that I will make Jerusalem a heavy stone for all the peoples. All who lift it will be severely injured. All the nations of the earth will be gathered against it. What happens in Armageddon? All the nations have come against Israel, against Jerusalem. So we know the timing of this. And we see, as I said, if you can't continue down those verses, we see that much of Israel unfortunately um, goes into I'm trying to find where it is she she suffers consequences that are horrendous okay maybe it was a little earlier than chapter 12 that is in Zechariah where it talks about how a third is cut off and a third is cut off again but God always keeps his remnant he's always faithful and here we have in verse 10 I will pour out and I speaking is God speaking I will pour out on the house of David Okay, is he pouring it out on the Gentiles? No. no. The house of David is representative of Israel. Okay, I will pour out on Israel. On the inhabitants of Jerusalem. Jerusalem. Notice this Jerusalem. I'm not pouring it out on... Okay, okay, let's go to Utah because they claim it. <laughs> let's go to Ram because they want it. No, he says, I'm going to pour out on the house of David. On the inhabitants of Jerusalem, the Spirit, remember the Ruch HaKodesh, who permeates and brings to fulfillment the will of God the Father that is sent out. We see all the way back from the beginning, I told you God the Father and God the Son created. Where is the Spirit in that? Verse 2, the Spirit hovered over the face of the earth. The Spirit was there, in their presence, carrying it out. How do I explain that better? Ask me when we're in heaven. <laughs> okay, the spirit of grace, the spirit of supplication, he's going to put his spirit in them, and that's why they look on me. Now, remember I said God speaking. So they're going to look on me, God, whom they have pierced. Wait a minute, God. When were you pierced? Once again, I take you to that unbelieving Jewish person who is willing to look at prophecy with me, their own scriptures, and they will see. When was God pierced? Remember, where did you get those wounds in your hands? I got them when I was in the house of my friends. I got them when I was in Israel. God is speaking and he's declaring you pierced to me. How? In Yeshua. Because God the Son is God the Father. So in that, we have our two. Hang on. They're going to mourn for him. They're mourning for the one that you call Jesus, the one I call Yeshua. They're mourning for this one who was pierced. This one mourns for an only son. Do you know the pain of a mother and a father who loses their only son, who realizes they've missed their son? I remember hearing and my adopted grandma once say, you, uh, the parents should never have to endure the death of their that's child. Right. That's, that that's just not fair and not that's right. Solid. That's a, a horrible pain. They're going to mourn. They're going to weep bitterly over him like a weeping over a firstborn. What's happening? They're seeing him come. And when they see him come and they realize and they recognize in that day, at that moment, wow, wow. You were, you are our Messiah. Baruch Hababa Shema Adonai. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. And as he comes, salvation is coming to Israel at that moment. And they are seeing, and he is going to declare it one victory. He is going to set up his kingdom there. 
in Yerushalayim where he returned. And other prophecy tells us his feet literally touch on the Mount of Olives. It is cleft in two. It is made wide, this valley. Why? Because he's going to be setting up his temple. And it's not going to be small people. Because all the nations of the world are going to have to come up and go through it for their blessing. So it's got to be big. And I don't know how he's going to work that. That, to me, in our day and age, would be a transportation nightmare. You think our people at the airports, our, our air controllers have a problem? <laughs> it's going to take angelic supervision <laughs> to make this work. But we see that God literally opens up the land to prepare it for that. And it happens rapidly. We're going to get that as we go on today. So let me also bring out the point that Israel will dwell in earthly Jerusalem during a period of time we call the millennium. You've heard me say this time and again, and guess what? We're getting there. Chapter 20, we will see that said six times. We'll get there. We'll get there. Six times. It's going to be said to us. Millennium simply means a thousand years. So we're told there is a period of time. If God says it once, twice, three, four, five, six times, I think he's telling us something specific. I'm going to take him exactly what he said. He is going to have a millennial kingdom on earth for a thousand years. Israel will be the head nation during that time. Remember all of those promises in the scripture, in the original covenant, that God promised Israel? Here's the fulfillment. Because Israel deserved it? No. Because God is faithful. He keeps his word. And here it is. Israel will dwell on the earth during the millennium, receive its earthly blessings that God has promised, and at that time, what we've referred to as the bride, the called out assembly, her home is the heavenly Jerusalem. Revelation 21. Look with me at Revelation 21, verse 1. Revelation 21 and verse 1. And we'll see where our home is. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and further first first heaven and first earth passed away, and there is no longer any sea. This is actually after our millennium, too, by the way. But we're seeing where our headquarters has been and will be. I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem. Okay, notice the holy city. When it's called that, we're not talking about the earthly Jerusalem. We're calling the fact that the Holy City is coming down out of heaven from God, made ready as like a bride adorned for her husband. Remember, we were called the bride? We're adorned like the bride. We're going to see that we're referred to as the bride, okay? And our headquarters then is the Holy City, the New Jerusalem, not the earthly Jerusalem, the New Jerusalem. I heard a voice from the throne saying, Behold, pay attention, the tabernacle of God is among men, and he will dwell among them. That's the tabernacle. He will tabernacle among them. They will be his people, and God himself will be among them. So he's going to tabernacle. He's going to dwell with his people. It's not the separation. It's a beautiful, complete picture that we see here. And he will wipe away every tear from their eyes. Okay, now, he's talking about the ones that, the bride that he's just described in the holy city, that that's where they are, that he's tabernacling with them. He's dwelling with them. That is where we see that there's no more tears. There's no more death. There's no more mourning. There's no more crying. There's no more pain. The first things have passed away. We don't have earthly we have heavenly. That is what we're seeing here. Revelation 21, 1 through 3, drop down to verse 9. The one of the seven angels who had the seven bowls full of the seven last plagues, and we're on that last one, remember, we've been, we've been talking about it, spoke with me saying, come here, I will show you the bride, the wife of the Lamb. And we read in verse 10, he carried me away in the spirit to a great and high mountain and showed me the holy city, Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God. Remember the Lamb 
is the Son of God. Mm -hmm. So with the bride that's being shown, her, her, what did it say? I'm going to show you, come here, I'll show you the, the wife of the Lamb. The holy city of Jerusalem, see that is the bride's home, the holy city of Jerusalem. Okay, I think we've got it. Let's go back to chapter 19. Did you think we'd get there? Let's go back to chapter 19 and look at verse 7 because we've got our bride. We've had our ceremony. I'll show you proof of how I know we've had our ceremony. We're married, okay? And it tells us, let us rejoice and be glad and give glory to him for the marriage of the Lamb has, past tense, has come. The marriage has come. His bride has made herself ready. We made ourselves ready in the blood of the Lamb. We made ourselves ready by coming into right relationship with him. And here's what, let me read verse 8 and then break it down some more too, okay? It was given to her to clothe herself in fine linen, bright and clean. For the fine linen is the righteous acts of the saints. What do we see is the bridal gown. The bride's made herself ready. She is dressed in her bridal gown. Okay, we're going to look at what that is. And let me point out to you, we receive our rewards at the judgment seat of Christ. Our rewards are the robe of righteousness that we get to put on, that we get because of his righteousness and we're in him, and the crowns that I've taught you about before too. I've given you this before, so I'm just summarizing it up. So we have been to the judgment seat of Christ. That means we've been in heaven. That means the rapture has to have occurred. We have been with them. We have received our rewards. Remember, the believer stands before the judgment seat of Christ to receive reward for what he did for the Lord. He may lose reward, but he's in heaven. He never loses his standing in heaven. He does not lose his salvation. He may lose and not get a crown that he could have had. But he doesn't lose his salvation. And now we're seeing that the bride has been at that judgment seat. The bride has been made ready. She has put on his robe of righteousness. That is how she made herself ready. And it was granted to her, verse 8, it was given to her or granted to her to clothe herself. See, God granted it. He granted it because we came through the shed blood of the Lamb. By God's grace, by his worthiness. By his doing, not by our works. Our works receive reward, but they don't receive salvation. We can never earn it. And if you don't earn it, you also can't lose it. That's all in God's control. And hallelujah. We are clothed. We are arrayed. We are clothed in our wedding gown. Uh, our linen uh, is white. That represents righteousness. You may have bright cleanliness. How are we made white and bright and clean? In our salvation, in that shed blood of Yeshua, who washed us white as snow. Remember Yeshua, Isaiah 118, come let us reason together. Though your sins be as scarlet, they will be as white as snow. And it repeats it in just a slightly different phrase to get the point across. You're made pure, you're made white, you're made clean, you put on a robe of righteousness that is his robe. He clothes us. And it is beautiful. And the righteousness or the righteous acts, the Greek gives us the idea that it's plural, that it's more acts. That's, again, the reward that we receive as we work out our salvation. Notice I didn't say work for our salvation. You don't work for it, you work it out. That's why James says, show me your faith by your works. Because you, what, what's in you is going to show by what you do. But it's not what you do that gets you saved. You don't clean yourself up and then present yourself clean to God. You go to filthy, our righteousness is as filthy rags. Yeshua is at 64, 6. He cleans you up. He puts his spirit in you. He puts his robe of righteousness over you. And then you go out in his power that is now living in you. The Ruch HaKodesh, the Holy Spirit, who is enabling you to now do the will of the Father. Now able to carry on. And remember those commandments that I spoke about earlier and said we don't throw the baby out with the bathwater? Now we see this is what we're to be doing is working it out. A good way to put it is to tell you when you got saved, you got the deed to a mine. Okay? You know, like a gold mine? Yeah. Okay, precious metals mine. I'll put it that way. 
You own that mind. It's yours. That's what you can say. It's mine. Because <laughs> it's yours. Now, if you do nothing with that mind, it's still yours, but you're not going to get the full benefit. If you get in there and you start ticking and you start chiseling, oh, I found a gold nugget. Oh, I found silver. I found precious ore. What's in the Word of God? Nuggets. Amen. Nuggets. Get into the work. Dig it out. <coughs> Find those nuggets. What are those nuggets going to do? Enrich you. I don't mean literally enrich you. I don't mean silver and gold of earth, but I mean of the heavenlies. That's what's going to be pouring into you and out of you. And as you work out your salvation and you show to the world, you don't do it by your power, you do it by the power of God who is in you. And then he goes and rewards you for it. How good is that? <laughs> but again, remember what we get to do with those real ones, because that is what thrills me no end, is that I get to have something in my hands to present to my Lord when I want to say thank you. Hallelujah. Amen. Thank you. Yes. 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 Let me back up what I'm saying. Ephesians 2.10. <coughs> Ephesians 2.10. And yeah, another hallelujah. <laughs> hallelujah. Okay, Ephesians, where do you go? There you are. Ephesians 2.10. You're probably all very familiar with the first verse is that for by grace are you saved through faith. And it is the work of God, not of yourselves, lest any man should boast. I think I skipped the phrase in there. Uh, but you know what, well what I'm talking about. Uh, maybe I didn't. Maybe I got it all in there. Okay. Um, verse 10. We are his workmanship. Created in... Messiah Yeshua in Christ Jesus for good works, which God Elohim prepared beforehand so that we would walk in them. He prepares us. He doesn't look for ability. He looks for availability. He's the one that makes you able. You show up for, to allow Him to work through you, and He does it. So. There goes the excuse of, oh, I'm not good enough, Lord. I can't talk. Remember Moshe? I can't talk, Lord. Send my brother. <laughs> Whatever excuse you want, God's answer to you is, I didn't ask you if you could do it. I asked you if you'd be open for me to do it through you. And it will surprise you what he does in you. Because it's not you. It's you. 1 Corinthians 3, verses 9 through 15 tells us about getting those rewards. 1 Corinthians 3. 1 Corinthians 3 is in the new. Go past the Gospels, go a little bit further, you'll get the 1 Corinthians. 1 Corinthians 3, 9 through 15. For we are God's fellow workers. You are God's field, God's building. According to the grace of God, which was given to me like a wise master builder, I laid a foundation. What's the foundation? Christ. Yeshua, Jesus. He's our rock. He's our salvation. He's our foundation. And now there's building on it. But each man must be careful how he builds. For no man can lay a foundation other than the one which is laid, which is Yeshua on the ship, Jesus Christ. You can't go build with another God. You can't build anything on this that's apart from Yeshua with Jesus. That's the only thing that's going to attach itself to there. Now, if a man builds on the foundation with gold and silver and precious stones and wood, hay, and straw, he's used everything, it sounds like. Each man's work will become evident, for the day will show it because it's revealed with fire. Remember, fire is like a judgment. It was called the judgment seat of Christ. But this is not a scary judgment. This is not to find out if we're condemned or accepted. We're already in heaven. We're already accepted. We're already... <coughs> Clothed in righteousness, his righteousness, we're just there to receive crowns or not receive crowns at the Bema seat, the judgment seat of Christ. Yes, the Bema seat. Okay, so that fire is, the fire itself will test the quality of each man's work. If any man's work which he has built on it remains, when that fire goes through, anything that remains, you get reward for. If the work is burned up, You'll suffer that loss of that reward. Notice it says that he himself will be saved, so as through fire. So even Shaul Paul wanted to make sure very clear, don't fear that you won't be saved. You're saved, you're accepted, you're in heaven. Now you might have the smoke as your coattail. <laughs> but you're in. <laughs> okay? Okay? 
What burns up in a fire? Wood, hay, and stubble. What remains? Gold, silver, precious stone. The work that you allow God to do in you, that's the work that's gold, silver, precious stone. The work that you do of yourself for your glory, thinking you're doing it for the Lord, but wow, look at me. Or, I'm so good, I did this. No, that's what will burn up. You hear from these fires, what has been left. Is the exactly wedding right rings there. and yeah the jewelry, precious the precious stones, yes. And I know it literally from a neighbor's fire. Everything goes in a fire. But the precious stones do last. Okay, uh, so that's our rewards, Philippians 2.13. Philippians 2.13 makes it clear again. So, you know, I'm not the one telling you how you get it and how you don't. The Word of God is the one telling you. In Philippians 2.13, it says, But it is God who is at work in you, both to will and to work, or to do His good pleasure. So, He puts the desire in you. He gives the ability to you. And then He does it. I don't know about you, but I don't think it gets any better than that. Because if it's dependent on me, I'll blow it every time, and I know it. But God shows me his faithfulness. It is he, he does it, he puts a desire there, and then he does it himself completely. So, I mean, wow. All we have to do is just show up. Just show up. That's it. Okay? Let me show you the rub of righteousness. We'll take it from the original, and we'll take it from our new. Go to Isaiah 64, 10. Oh, sorry, Isaiah 61, 10. Isaiah 61 and verse 10. Okay, where did Isaiah go? <laughs> there we go. Isaiah 61 and verse 10. Isaiah 61, 10 says, I will rejoice greatly in the Lord. My soul will exalt in my God. For he has clothed me with garments of salvation. He has wrapped me with a robe of righteousness as a bridegroom decks himself with a garland and as a bride adorns herself with jewels. Does that just sum up in one verse what we've been talking about? Yes. Yes. We're the bride, yes. he's the bridegroom, and he dresses us, he does it all. Remember last week when I took you through the Oriental customs and I told you in that period of engagement that was as good as marriage when the son had gone to prepare the home for the new couple? Remember, he was to take care of the bride's needs. He would send someone even to help her if she needed. Well, guess what? We needed help. And he sent us the Ruch HaKodesh, the Holy Spirit, to enable us, to keep us, to adorn us, to make us what we are in him. He did it. Aren't we blessed? Romans 3, I love it, Tony. Hallelujah. Romans 3, 21. 21 and 22 we're going to look at. Romans 3. Again, by Shaol Paul. Why do I say it that way? To remind you, he's a good Jewish boy who believes in Yeshua. And he says, but now apart from the law, the righteousness of God has been manifested, being witnessed by the law and the prophets. Even the righteousness of God, how? Through faith in Jesus Christ, in Yeshua, on the ship. For all those who believe her, there is no distinction. What's he going to get into later? There's no distinction in Jew and in Gentile, in free and in slave, in rich and in poor. We all come in the same way. It's done in and through Jesus. Yeah. Romans 3, 21 and 22. Yeshua is the one who we receive our salvation through. And it's He, and it's He alone. It's not Yeshua and anything. It's Yeshua alone. Hallelujah. Okay, so we were married to Him. We have a marriage supper. That follows the marriage, right? Okay, verse 9 of Revelation 19. Oh, where did that talk go? Let's see if we can get to the guests. Let's see if we can. Revelation, whoops, I just went to Revelation 9. Revelation 19 and verse 9. And I'm still in 9, sorry. Revelation 19 and verse 9. 
Okay, just to refresh your mind, we've got, we're closed, okay? So we've got a bridal gown on, we've been married. Then he said to me, Yochanan. Remember, Yochanan's recording this. Right, blessed are those who are invited to the marriage supper of the Lamb. Who's got married? The Lamb. The Lamb is Messiah. Remember in Revelation chapter 5? God was on the throne holding the seal, the, um, the scroll that had the seven seals on it. And it was asked, who can open it? And the only one who can open it is the one who owns it. And we see, as we go into it, it's a title deed to the earth. But the only one who could open it that was found worthy in heaven, on earth, under the earth, I don't care where you went, the only one found worthy was the lamb who had been slain. Remember, he looked as if he'd been slain, but he was the lamb risen. Remember, from the lamb slain to the lamb reign. <laughs> he reigns. And that's R-E-I-G-M. <laughs> he reigns. So, back here is the who's invited to the marriage supper of the lamb. Okay, well, let's look at that. Who is? You may have in your version also which are called. Okay, called or invited. Same thing. Okay? Who is that? Is that the bride? No. The bride's not invited to her own wedding. She puts out the invitation with her bridegroom. So the ones who are invited must be the Old Testament and, I think, the Tribulation Saints because we're at the end now. We are going into that millennium. We're going to see that. In fact, I really think because of the wording, and we're not going to, we might get to it if I can finish my entire thought. We're going to see, in my belief, from the wording that the marriage supper has to take place or is taking place on the earth. If so, then it has to be right at the start of the millennium. Why do I say that? Because some people believe it takes place in heaven before they come down to earth. I can see how they get it, but I think the wording is a little too exacting. I really believe that the beginning of the millennium is the timing of the marriage so after the tribulation. After the tribulation has ended. During the tribulation, <laughs> I believe now what we've seen is we have stood before the judgment seat of Christ. We've received our rewards. We've, In essence, we were married when we accepted the Lord. We know that. But we've progressed to that point that we are seen in our bridal gown, and we return with him to the marriage supper that we'll see on earth. And I'll bring out why I see that on earth in just a little bit. But that opens it up then, so who is going to come? I believe it will be the Old Testament saints, it will be tribulation saints, and it may also even be those who lived out the, the uh, tribulation period who were believers. They're going to be a very small number because the majority of them we already saw were martyred under the throne. But there will be some who do make it to the end who will go into the millennium. We'll go into that. We'll look at Matthew 25 and we'll see that at another time because we definitely won't get that far today. But it's the guests, not the bride, who are called to, invited to the wedding. Look at Yochanan, John 3, 29. Okay? John 3, 29. Same author that his much earlier writing, which was for a whole different purpose. One of the Gospels that we have. In verse 29, he says, He who has the bride is the bridegroom, but the friend of the bridegroom who stands and hears him. So those who are with them, standing with them, the guests who could fit into that category, I think also who stands and hears him, rejoices greatly because of the bridegroom's voice. So this joy of mine has been made full. Remember I said we get it all wrong? Our focus here on earth, it's all about the bride. But it's the marriage feast of the Lamb. It's all about the Lamb. And so it's the rejoicing in the Lamb. Okay? And it's, it's, uh, it's the friends who are hearing, who are rejoicing. So it, it, I believe all heaven's going to hear. But um, I believe the ones who are invited there on the earth would be the Old Testament, the Tribulation Saints, the, the, um, and then the others that, that have survived it. Um, we don't have the time to go through it in its entirety, but if you look at Matthew 22, and I'll just get you started with it, I'll let you look at it on your own, we can discuss it next week when we come back together. Uh, Matthew chapter 22, verses 1 through 14, give us an idea. It's a parable from Yeshua, and it's talking about the wedding feast and those who were invited, and the ones who were invited didn't want to come. They didn't come. And so finally we, we read down in verse um, 9. Go therefore to the main highways. As many as you find there, invite to the wedding feast. 
So slaves went out to the streets and gathered together all they found, both evil and good. The wedding hall was filled with the dinner guests. That you're going to find those who are in this that are not dressed appropriately. They're not dressed in the righteousness of the Lord. They're not allowed to stay. They're cast out. So there are those who come and say, Oh, Lord, Lord, didn't I do this and that in your name? And he's going to say, Depart from me. I never knew you. They have to be in his family, so to speak. Okay? So, again, we don't have time to go through it in detail. I'm just trying to give you a complete thought. We'll pick it back up next week. But the guests without the wedding garments are not invited to the wedding feast. They have to be clothed in his righteousness. Matthew 25 tells us about the ten virgins. Five are ready, five are not. The five are ready go into the feast. The door is closed. The other five come late. Oh, let us in, let us in. No, you had to be ready. There's not a second chance. Yeah. You have to be ready. Okay? So um, they were the lost? Yes. Not, not carnal. They were lost. They're lost. Completely. They're lost. They're lost. They're yes. Lost. Yeah. Um, okay. Uh, let me see real quick if I want to take you to this or if I want to do this next week. Sorry. Give me just a quick second get a quick peek and see. Um, well, it's, it still fits, and it'll even bring out to you why I think we may have Old Testament um, believers that come. Uh, verse uh, 11 of chapter 8 in Matthew. Verse 11, chapter 8. It says, I say to you that many will come from east and west and recline at the table with Abraham, Yitzhak, and Yaakov, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven. But the sons of the kingdom will be cast out of the out of darkness, and that place will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. I believe that's referring to the same picture that we're drawing on right here. And Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob says to me, the, the Old Testament saints are there. They're part of this celebration. Okay? They came, they were not the bride of Christ, but they were the group, the saints that we're looking toward the cross. Remember, God has the saints in every time. God has the saints all the way back. God has the saints all the way forward. The word saint does not, that was Matthew 8, 11. I'm sorry, Matthew chapter 8, verse 11. That the word saint is not just for our time period. That's why you have tribulation saints, because they're people who came to believe during the tribulation. That's why you have saints before the church began. Mm -hmm. So you have to remember that to see that and understand this. That, um, um, and I'm losing my train of thought because I'm trying to hurry and finish the thoughts. Um, <coughs> well, maybe I've said it. Okay, so why I, that's where I was getting it. Why I said Old Testament saints, I believe, may be at the marriage supper because yeah. they'll be part of the guests. They're not the bride. But they're part of the guests. They were yeah. called. They were chosen. They're in his righteousness also. Amen. Okay? And again, remember that biblical wedding, the wedding during the biblical period of time? They had the legal consummation of the marriage by the parents. Remember the father chose the bride for the son? Remember yeah. that? God chose us before the foundation of the earth. He didn't choose us on the basis of any good he saw in us. He chose us out of his love before the foundation of the earth. He chose us to be a bride for his son. Even specifically, we can say those who were born during this time because we are the bride, okay? The bridegroom comes, claims his bride, and he carries her home. And remember, he does it all. It's even said that she wasn't supposed to walk. She was carried in some way, just to show it's none of her power, it's not on her own power. He did all, and he brings her home. And then, when he's brought her to his home, that's when the wedding supper takes place. They have their ceremony, and then he presents his bride to the, the neighbors, to those around, to those who are called to the feast, okay? And uh, I think if we go back real fast, and we'll finish off right here, but in Revelation 19, I think we can finish our thought, and like I said, we can pick this back up and discuss it, discuss it a little more next week if we need to, but um, we're finishing up verse 9. Uh, okay, I think I've, yeah. Uh, I may have forgotten to read the beginning of verse 9, but we've been talking about it. Then he said to me, right, blessed are those who are invited to the marriage supper of the Lamb. So they had to be invited. Blessed are those who are invited. And he said to me, 
the boy Zalihab that speaking to Yochanan said, these are true words or the true sayings of God. What's he pointing to? He's making it clear. This is God speaking. This is what God is saying. This is not something that man's making up. It's not something that Yochanan's writing out of his own thoughts. No, this is the voice of God. This is God presenting this picture. He's letting us know, hey, I've picked a bride for my son. I have told my son the house is ready enough. Go get your bride. Bring her home. Adorn her in her wedding gown. Give her her rewards. And let's put on the marriage feast, son. And here it comes. So we will look at more of that when we pick up in verse 10 next week. That uh, Yohanan is so caught up in it, he wants to start worshiping. What happens to us? Don't we get excited? Don't we start worshiping? That <laughs> Yohanan has a little problem. Oops. <laughs> we'll look at that oops next week and see what his little problem is. But come back next week and we will get... Uh, We'll, we'll, I'm sorry, Rosa, because I know you're going to miss it. But we're going to see heaven open up, and we're going to see the glory of God. And the glory of God is going to come down the earth. It is going to touch this earth like it's never happened before, because it's going to be in all His glory. So I'm going to warn you. Put on your shouting voices. Get your hallelujahs ready. We are going to lift the ceiling and we're going to send out our praises because you're going to be saying again and again hallelujah hallelujah why because the lord of lords and the king of kings is coming in all his glory hallelujah and on that note we will close almost can i drop tape keep the tape on leave it on okay okay what are we doing Oh, okay. Okay, this is all news to me, everybody. But if you're wanting the last two classes, and hopefully today I'll go there. I hate to erase it. I don't want to erase it. Um, you, okay, you type in Hebrew Christian Witness, and it's space. It's not capitalized. It's space. Hebrew Christian, yes, it's space, just like it's you would write it. Small letters. Small letters. Hebrew Christian witness. And then do a space again and do HCW, which stands for Hebrew Christian witness. This is on YouTube. Actually, it is on YouTube, but you just type in the browser, it pops up on top anyways. Oh, okay. Okay, then, then never mind. I won't put that part up. I thought they had to go to YouTube to get it. Okay, that will take you to YouTube, and I understand the last two classes are there. So we're beginning to get a breakthrough. And that means also stay tuned because you should be able to start getting Pastor Gil's thoughts or Rosa's up there too. That and remember, when you're in class, that camera picks up everything. So when I'm back there, I don't want to have my hair anything, but I can hear people talking or playing a little video or something. Oh, okay. but it was cell phones off. It was cell phones on and off today. Remind me and I'll try to. Okay. What he's saying is be careful. I went to a service recently also where they had a disclaimer in what was written, and they said, please be aware that this goes around the world. So if you want the whole world to hear, <laughs> because even your whispering is picked up. So if, it, if you need clarity, you need the verse or something, I don't want to leave anybody out. But if it's, you know, little discussions among yourselves, just be aware that that's being carried too, okay? But we had a great class. It picks everything up. We can't avoid, you know, and we just we try to stay as clear in this Christmas. Can I ask one question? Who brought these little lemon bar things? Oh, Lord, honey, those are like... <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. Those are so good. Okay. Oh, so and on that physical note... <laughs> <laughs> oh, okay. 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 Let me close us in prayer. And let me take us from the earthly back to the heavenly. Okay. She's no. telling how heavenly those are, and I'm not taking anything away from her. Can't compare to that. <laughs> this is a story. Okay, this is a story. A person knew that he was going to die and go to heaven.
have been sin, and so he made a deal with God. And he got allowed from God that he was going to get to bring one suitcase to heaven with him. So he dies, and he shows up at the pearly gate, and of course Peter's the one at the gate, as all stories go. And Peter sees his suitcase and says, uh, 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 you can come in, but your suitcase has to stay out. He says, no, 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 no. I got special permission. I get to bring my suitcase in. He goes, nah, I don't believe this, but okay. And he sends an angel down to get the word from the throne room. And the word comes back, yes, he did. He was allowed to bring in one suitcase and one suitcase only. Peter's blown away by this. He says, all right, okay, go ahead, bring it in. And then you've got to open it up. We all got to see what's so valuable, so important that you brought it into heaven. And he opens up the suitcase and so proud because he's got his gold bricks in there. You know, our most valuable possession on earth is gold. And he's got his gold bricks in there. And Peter looks at that and he says, Asphalt? You brought asphalt to heaven? <laughs> I 
Look around